very big man, very loud, very Barry Whiteish. It was his politics that they were afraid of. Everything he did was all about kind of challenging. They had a tremendous respect for him, a tremendous trust for him. He would leave the community better than he found it. We must be active. We cannot afford to be complacent. We cannot afford to leave the destiny of our lives to, to other people. If you look throughout this country, other communities have something which they own, which they value, which they sustain. And sadly, we oftentimes will find more reasons why we shouldn't have anything than why we should. And Nana Bonson was of that we have to have, we have to do for self. So the driving force was about having that space, that safe space for our young people, for our elders, for our community. And I think that was what, that was what drove him. The WFCC, most people know it as Carmelwood, or I remember it If you could remember, go back in those days, there wasn't, uh, there weren't any places around for black people to socialize. And so that aspect of the of our culture then, I suppose, it was more actually dominated. So it was seen as being a hub for socials, many dances and that sort of thing. But as time went on, it, it developed into doing more things than that. It ran a youth club, it ran uh, workshops and started getting involved with the local community, sorry, with the local colleges and the local council to get facilities to, um, to do youth work and, and youth provision to try to get more people trained up. Uh, into uh, 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 things like um, mechanical engineering, motor mechanic engineering, TV technicians and that sort of thing. And so it formed links with the college as well. And so it had an educational aspect. Um, the other part of that educational aspect was the running of the Saturday school. Because black kids, when because they couldn't speak English in the way that they think they ought to speak English, they were rendered um, you know, as being educational subnormal, and they put them into schools for the edu educational subnormal. Nowadays, we'd call it schools for the education of people who've got learning disability. But a whole generation of black kids were incarcerated into those into those organisations, and it destroyed them. So Barry was active in terms of campaigning against that, and of course, the supplementary school, the Saturday school, became a way of actually to fight back. It wasn't just about can you spell. It wasn't just about, you know, can you add up to, you know, your maths? Um, how are you doing in school? It was wider than that. It was about giving people a sense, the young people who attended, and, and indirectly their parents, giving them a sense of what we as a black people, who we were, what we were doing, what we had achieved. First meeting with Beresford Edwards was attending um, the Camel Road Centre, community centre. We spoke, we talked um, very much about education and, and, and uplifting people. So for me, as a young man, it was a, a gradual movement towards him. We played sport, played, played table tennis and so forth. In terms of um, education, he was always um, not pushing the, the need for education, but the responsibility of taking that opportunity. Because in this country, basically, you have free education if you wanted it at that time. So to deny yourself of that free opportunity didn't make sense if you wanted to be somebody and you wanted to carry yourself. So for me, he was always pushing that in terms of do right by what you've got. If it's not costing you, why deny it? Part of the testimony to the influence of the Saturday School is that we began to, to hear about other Saturday Schools up and down the country. I'm not saying that Carmel Road was the first. I don't think we were actually the first. But I think that the influence of what was happening in Manchester uh, was very strong elsewhere in the country. Okay, uh, We had people who... Um, would come and look at the school or would phone up Barry or uh, just kind of like talk about it. And I think it helped to strengthen Saturday schools elsewhere. His longing to defend the rights of black people and challenging institutional discrimination 
influenced his support to various other struggles in Manchester and other parts of the UK. We were concerned about rights, we were concerned about dignity, we were concerned about the quality of life for people, right? And we were so strong that when we came out, we came out in the street in thousands. We had so many demonstrations. Um, there was the Cynthia Gordon, the, I think they were trying to, to deport her, send her away, and um, they managed to, to stop that. Yeah. There was the New Cross Massacre. Um, we all went down and supported. Yeah. Um, in fact, when, um, when we got into London and we passed through, I can't remember where it was now, when we passed, anyway, when we passed through the area, the school children, when they heard that we had come from Manchester and we were on this, um, you know, this, this demonstration, jumped out of the school windows and followed us, followed us about thousands and thousands of people. The impact he made on the black community was profound. He also made a, an impact on the establishment as well, because I think through the campaigns that he actually had organized, marches and seminars and conferences and so on and so forth, that helped to put pressure on, on, on the establishment. And I know that he, he had actually, uh, he campaigned heavily against, for example, the city council. If you take a, um, an issue which I suppose in a way um, we always lose on, um, it's, it's the issue around fighting for justice because we've never got justice the day will never come and that's why you've got to keep fighting sometimes you'll lose those those campaigns but um, campaigns uh, um, at times when we had uh, issues around policing in in the city of ours where um, the, the the style of policing was um, was massively challenging to all of the the inner city communities but obviously in particular um, to, uh, to to young afro-caribbean males um, when the the style of policing was very much like uh, um, an army of occupation rather than uh, a police service was, that was there to work with the local community. A woman had been killed in the park and um, it was said, I mean, initially that the African-Caribbean community were helping the police tremendously with their inquiries and all this was being emblazoned across the, the press um, and then suddenly... Uh, it was said that the person responsible had dreadlocks, was of African-Caribbean descent, who was, who was doing the killing, who did the killing. And so the police used the opportunity to, to drag in um, a whole lot of guys that had dreadlocks to search their houses, to keep them in those paper suits that they had to, you know, took all the clothes off them, put these paper suits on kept them in those paper suits for ages, something like 24 or 48 hours. And in the meantime, they just used it as an opportunity to go into their houses and see whatever was there that they could hold then some sort of case against them, whether it had anything to do with Elsa Hannaway or not. So within a very sh few days, from being a sign of cooperation between the police and the, and the community, you get a complete <clears throat> overturn of that position. And... Um, there was a, a meeting of probably about four, four or five hundred people and there was an awful lot of emotion coming out, angry uh, exchanges taking place. And you, to be able to stand up there, you had to have a sense that the community trusted you. But it's people like Beresford that would always have the confidence to stand up in those situations and know that people knew where he was coming from and that they had a tremendous respect for him, a tremendous trust for him. And he was able to speak where others would, would stand back and, and say, no, no way. There are people who felt that they didn't like Barry at the town hall. They loved Barry in terms, no, like, in terms of his politics. And it was his politics that they were afraid of. Because his politics was a politics of saying to them, look, this is how you need to change. They talk about institutional racism. But he was the first man to have said that society is institutionally racist. Where they felt at the time that it was a challenge. Then we had the, the, the um, high, uh, sorry, police officer, what was his name, Wilmot. He came, you remember? And he said, the police force is institutionally racist. But he wasn't doing that in terms of 
uh, supporting what he was doing it because he wanted a job in the Met to, to challenge them. Then Stephen Lawrence came, then the McPherson report came, and all these reports, and some people thinking, ah, but he was ahead of his time. He had so many battles to fight, and each battle that he fought made him stronger. And those resources that developed within him, he used to inspire others with it. You have a problem, you can overcome. Let's see how we can do, what action is needed. And so this very positive approach to not allowing things to pile up on top of you. Stand up tall, question what is going on, and you will find a way. As a staunch Marcus Garvey follower, with a firm belief in uplifting the African nation, his drive and dedication through the Pan-African Congress movement would see him work alongside many people, such as American civil rights campaigner Dr. Barry Shankle. To me, the memory of him has been a solid uh, African revolution nationalist. Uh, when I say that, I mean that you have some people who are nationalists. You can be a nationalist from Trinidad, Barbados, uh, Jamaica, but Nana Bonds is, is a revolutionary nationalist, and that nationalist means you look at black nationalism complete as a whole. That's Pan-Africanism. So he joined the Pan-African uh, movement, and he became the chairman of the Manchester chapter, you know, because in Manchester we had branches all over the place, and so these chapters, you know, in the country, and we still do. And Nana Bonson was very instrumental in pushing for a, a constant, um, you know, unification of African people. He was very interested in kind of black history and black achievements, and he felt that that should be celebrated. And there'd be a week of activities, there'd be food, there'd be singing, there'd be poetry, um, uh, readings, there'd be um, uh, books on sale, there'd be dancing and singing. And Barry would organise this every year for, I don't know, maybe eight, ten years, Africa Week. It was always, well not always, it was usually very, very well attended. Uh, it was a kind of highlight of, of the activities that went on at Carmel Road for many, many, many years. And of course, it was all part of his, um, oh, you have to admire that man's work. I don't know how he found the funding. It was like every year, it was a struggle to find the money to put this activity on. Every year, we'd kind of like, you know, bite our fingernails and worry about how we were going to do it. But every year we did it. And it was Barry's kind of energy and determination and kind of commitment to actually um, l having a kind of cultural celebration of who we were, where we had come from, what we wanted. It was that determination that was at the kind of the thrust that ensured that every year that happened. You have to be mentally ill if there's any black people who is in, is, who is in denial of being black. But there is a substantial number of black people who is in denial of being African. Because obviously the media portray Africa as a land which is a, fam a land of famine and disease. So no one wants to be associated with that kind of picture, do they? And so therefore you find that um, quite a number of us are not about being African. He was totally about being, not only being black, but also being of African heritage. And that's also important because as young people will tell you, um, one of the issues that they confront in schools is, the, is that absence of a clear self of who they are. And being part of who they are is about also embracing that African heritage. But because it has been shoved under the carpet or demonized and dismissed, you know, they're just left adrift. So, yes, so this, that's a very powerful legacy that he's left us with. He was never afraid of identifying himself as an African. Sometimes we hold on to these things, you know, it's Sia Creedian, I'm a Bajan, I'm a Jamaican, as if we went there on a cruise ship or, you know, a jumbo jet by choice, you know, so he wasn't sacred about, yes, he was from Guyana, as I'm from Jamaica, and that's part of my history, but 
you know, you can't be too sacred about it because that's just where they decided to drop us off for whatever reason. Nana Bunsen. And that was what I loved about him, you know. We, he wasn't into the tribalism business, you know, Jamaican and wherever you're from. It's about us as African people. was a proud African man. Yeah, all right, all right. A warrior mm. in struggle. Yes. yes. Right. right. Who acknowledged the continuity of his struggle yeah. with the struggle of our glorious ancestors. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Come on now. Come on. I've been called upon to read out my, my dad's life story. I'd like to greet everybody in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for coming and I don't even know what else to say, I'll just continue. Where he was able to draw upon the teachings of his mother and the Gava movement in Guyana, mm -hmm. and upon his extensive reading to bring an African centered perspective to his work on education, criminal justice, and youth development. After my father passed away, right, the whole course, as far as I'm concerned, I just went to pot. I mean all those you know all those leaders right what what the governments right or the council and so forth have done is take take out all those um, peripheral personnel right who were who were around my father and give them jobs here in this um, establish them give them jobs there in that establishment so they wouldn't actually be pro more as proactive as, as we were supposed to be, you know. So the legacy obviously became, it became non-existent for this time now. Hence the reason right, why we're struggling so hard as, as, as a people, as far as I'm concerned. Everybody, they've got, there's no more unity, right, as there was in times past, you know, with our people. The, that, that unity has been broken. I don't think Beresford was, would ever have been satisfied of how much he did. He was always trying to get more to do more and more and more. And I've always had um, a thing with him about the fact that he should pass the skills on to some of the younger people so that when he, when he left this earth that Carmel Road would not suffer um, after doing all of the work that they did that there was nobody to take up that struggle. And I mean, I've lived to see Karma Road has not developed anymore since, since Barry's gone. Um, the younger ones have just, um, they've left, they've dispersed, they've gone other places. And so we're more or less back into the, the same situation that we, were back, that we were in when we came over. There's, um, there's not a force strong enough to, 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 to struggle the way he did. And not only that, a lot of the, the young people see themselves as British, you know, and therefore entitled to whatever Britain has to offer. They don't see that they have an obligation to help, you know, to make things happen. I will say just a few things like what Edward Blyden has said once. He said, each race has a soul that finds expression to its institutions. When we destroy these institutions, we destroy the very soul of the people. Hence the reason why we must continue to celebrate and to continue to build institutions. <laughs> Thank you.